Hey, Pastor Jeremy here. Thank you so much for tuning in to what we hope is a great tool for you to utilize and to grow you in your walk with Jesus. Now, before we get started here, we want to invite you to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't done that. And then also hit that notification bell so that whenever we post stuff throughout the week, you'll get notification of it so you can use that resource to your benefit, but also you can share it with your friends and family as well. And then also we want to direct you to our website at fbcac.org, where you can find out more about our church family, uh, our different ministries, and then what God is doing and, and how he's using us to impact the kingdom here in Angels Camp, California. Now, here we go. We're about to get into the word of God proclaimed. Please feel free to leave a, a prayer request or, or a comment in the section below. Thank you guys so much for joining with us today. God bless you. And we love at the beginning of this calendar year, we dove into this most powerful, right? This most powerful uh, conversation um, in John chapters 13 through 16. It's provided us this kind of this up close and personal look about Jesus's heart, right? His heart for his people, his heart for what he wants to see out of them um, upon his departure to go be with the Father. And this has literally empowered the church for the last 2,000 years. This, this section of scripture, I believe, is probably the most rich biblically. Uh, it gives us the richest doctrine, the richest theology of who Jesus is and what he did for us and, and what he wants to see in our lives as a response. Um, and then after chapter 16, we kind of pivoted, right, with scripture, um, turning from that intimate uh, meal time that many of us gathered and, and kind of uh, witnessed what that would have been like um, 2,000 years ago at our Passover meal, by the way, uh, this past Thursday. For those of you who went, I, I pray that it blesses you. I hope it kind of gave you a little bit of insight into what Jesus and his friends um, experienced and what Jews have been doing for uh, virtually thousands of years um, in their hopes for a Messiah. And now we as Christians can see it not as an, a religious obligation, but as a celebration, knowing that all of that already pointed to the Messiah we know to be Jesus. Amen. So it's that Passover meal that Jesus and his friends now left. They're walking down towards the Kidron Valley, and he now breaks into prayer with the Heavenly Father, which we looked at throughout John chapter 17. And it gives us, again, this kind of this, this, uh, this deep insight into how Jesus prayed, right? This is really the only at-length prayer we see of Jesus in all of Scripture. And it's just this powerful time that he's spending with the Father. And it really kind of gives us the, the meat of why this series is called Upward and Onward. Jesus has been upwardly focused in prayer as the high priest of God and the only true intercessor, the only mediator between God and man. And now he concludes his prayer with an onward focus, praying for a people who have yet to come in his day, but will nevertheless play kind of a key role in his redemptive plan for mankind. And so I've entitled this message for today, uh, a prayer for today and tomorrow, because the end of John chapter 17 gives us this, this picture of Jesus praying for a future people, a people who have not yet breathed their first breath of life, many of which um, might be the case. And so he, this is a prayer for today and for tomorrow. And just kind of on a side note, one of, one of the most common mistakes we we make, and, and I think it's just a, a, an honest mistake that we make as, as readers, as studiers of God's word, is that often we, we unintentionally, and when I mean we don't do it intentionally, I mean like I think we genuinely have good motives. We want to understand the Bible, but we unintentionally insert ourselves into the text, right? Maybe you guys um, know what I'm talking about. In our desire to like personalize the Bible, right? We want to apply scripture and, and God's word to our lives. We make, the, it's, it's actually an error and it's called uh, eisegesis. Eisegesis just means inserting outside meaning into the text, right? And again, we do this, I think, with good motives. We want to apply it. We want to understand it. However, this is the opposite of what we should be doing. We should be exegeting the text. Exegete means take out of, right? And so we just read the Bible in its context, and we take meaning from that context, and we pull out how we are to understand what God's Word is saying. That's how we are supposed to read the text. So in other words, we have to remember that the Bible was not written about us. That's very important to understand. The Bible was not written about you, but it was written for you, okay? And so that's kind of going to give us a, a deep 
uh, or a way to deeply understand Scripture. And so keeping that in mind, we keep the main character the main character. Amen? God is the main character, not me, not you, not, not even the church. God is the main character. The Bible primarily reveals truth about God, and that's why we read Scripture. It's to get our eyes off of ourselves and onto Jesus, and then that gives us a better understanding of who he is and, in effect, who we are, right? That's kind of the, 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 the way that, that rolls. And so it's to, it's to get us to understand what Scripture is pointing at and the purpose for why the authors wrote what they wrote over the course of time. And it's primarily to get us to see this God, this, this holy God who loves us and who sent his son to die for us and to provide a sufficient sacrifice for sin, a sin that only deserves eternal separation from God. It's only deserving of eternal wrath. And somehow we escape that through the blood of Jesus when we put our faith in him. So with that said, John 17, 26 is kind of a unique passage. The reason why I, I said all that is because now John 17, verses 20 through 26, kind of breaks the mold. It no longer talks about the people in context. It's talking about this other people. It's talking about a future people. It's talking about a people who are not part of Jesus' day and time at that moment. In fact, I'm wondering if when the disciples overheard this portion of Jesus' prayer, they were thinking to themselves, who is he talking about? He's been praying for us. He's been praying to the Father. We get that. Now he's talking about a people who have yet to come. Who is that? And the fact that Jesus began to pray for a people yet to come points to a foundational truth of God's redemptive plan for humanity. And it's just fitting that this message falls on Easter Sunday. And in your outlines, this kind of gets us started. The resurrection reminds us that death does not have to be the end. Amen? Death does not have to be the end of your story. There is hope. There is life in Christ. Although Jesus knew his death was coming, that was for certain. He knew that on the other side of his death was the resurrection. And because of that, he would secure a way for you and me and all who will call on the name of Jesus to be saved. Here's the reality. Unless you are born again of the Spirit of the living God, you are dead in your sins. That is the testimony of Scripture. It's not my opinion, and I know it's not the popular thing to say in this uh, easy believism, sensitive, seeker-sensitive culture that we live, but it's the truth. And that's exactly what God's Word tells us. However, because of the death, and because of the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you don't have to remain in that state of spiritual death. Amen? Scripture is clear. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's a guarantee. You don't have to do anything. Isn't that good news? No longer do you have to try to be a good person to be acceptable by a holy God. It's not going to work. Amen? It's all by faith. We are saved by faith and through his grace. And all who have done that for the past 2,000 years are now the focus of Jesus' high priestly prayer here in John 17. So, John 17, hope you're with me. Um, we're going to begin in verse 20, and we're going to finish out the chapter to verse 26. This is the word of our Lord. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made them known to your I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your plan of redemption. And even though um, the death of Christ was an agonizing, excruciating 
embarrassing death. It secured for us our salvation. And so, Lord, um, as we now enter into this time and are confronted with your holy word, give us hearts to understand, minds to grasp, and ears to listen to your spirit speaking to us through your word. Help us to understand what you have to say to us today and help us to be transformed by it. We love you and we love your word. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. So as opposed to, again, like the vast majority of Scripture, we can actually exegete this passage faithfully and biblically and find that you and I are in the text, <laughs> okay? Um, obviously not individually. I don't see any of your names in there. My name is certainly not in there. I've looked, just not there. Um, so it's, we're not in there individually, but we are certainly there corporately. Okay, we are there corporately, and that's why this is a prayer for today and for tomorrow, right? In fact, at all points of history in the last 2,000 years, one could accurately say that this portion of Jesus' prayer was a prayer for today and tomorrow, right? A few days after, they could have remembered that prayer and thought to themselves, that was a prayer for today and for tomorrow, right? Um, uh, just within decades or even a few centuries of the birth of the early church, they could have reread that prayer and thought to themselves, this is a prayer for today and for tomorrow, right? Yesterday, we could have said, this is a prayer for today, which is yesterday, and tomorrow, which is today, and I guess that's how that works. <laughs> or we could just say, for today, this is a prayer for us. And it's a prayer for all who will come tomorrow. And in this passage uh, of, of this prayer, we're going to see kind of three aspects. We're going to kind of break it down into three aspects that um, Jesus is praying for directly for you and for me, for his church. First in your outlines, we see Jesus praying for our salvation. That, this is just phenomenal. Jesus, the Lord of glory, prays for our salvation. He says, I do not ask for these only. Right? He's talking about the disciples. So he's praying to the Father and saying, Father, I don't pray for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Interesting. So as with all scripture, there's kind of an immediate, direct context, and then there's also kind of a broader, general context, right? In the immediate context, he's talking about those who will come to faith literally being evangelized by the disciples, right? He's talking about Pentecost. He's talking about the days after, right? Thousands believed. The words of the disciples and the apostles, and they came to faith and the church exploded. So that's direct context, but then there's a general, broader context, and we are certainly in that context. We're in that group. And re it's referring to Scripture when he says uh, they, they will believe in me through their words. So we don't hear them speak directly to us, but we do hear them speak through Scripture through God's Word. It's, it's, it's their Word that is a reference to Scripture, and it's been handed, out, handed down through the ages to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. So in a sense, we still have the words of the disciples. And notice what he doesn't say. This is very important. He does not say, he does not say, I'm praying for all those who will come to faith through experience. He doesn't say, all those who will come to faith through tradition. No, it's through the Word. And Paul draws this out in even greater detail in his letter to the Ephesians. He writes in Ephesians 2, verses 13 through 22. He says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who are far off, and peace to those who were near. He's talking about the Gentiles who were far off and to the Jews who were near to God, but still didn't know him because Jesus had not been revealed yet. But now they know him because of the Savior. Verse 18, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, 
but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That's what we represent today. We are members of the household of God. And what are we built on? Verse 20, we're built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. We've come to believe through their word with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together in a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So Paul is explaining that the new church, the church now is the holy temple. By that time, well, just, just uh, this comes just before the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, right? And so he's saying, no longer is the temple built of mortar and brick. No, it's built of flesh. It's built of heart. It's built of spirit. We are the temple of the living God. And this is the church. It's, it's us. It's you and it's me. It's not a building, right? This building is not the church. We've said it time and time again. It's inaccurate to say I'm going to church today, right? Because you are the church. The church is gathering today. We could say that. But we can't go to church. We are the church. This is why we stress the importance of regular church attendance and fellowship. And it's not out of like religious legalism. It's not like we want you here all the time just because. No, it's because it's scripture. It's, it's the gathering of the body of Christ. Amen. You are the dwelling place of God. And I would say that God is most present when his people are together. Right. When the body is together, there is God. It's our foundation. God's word is our foundation. And how we come to believe in Jesus Christ. And, and look at what Jesus did for us. He, he brought us peace with God, right? If you, if you were paying attention, time and time again, Paul mentions that word, that word peace, right? He, he talks about peace to describe the new reality that we have in Christ. He, he is our peace. He brought, us near, uh, he brought us near to God and brought peace between man and God. And he even brought peace amongst men who were enemies, right? The Jews hated the Gentiles. And the Gentiles look down on the Jews. And now through the blood of Christ, they are brought into one body. Absolutely amazing. In other words, through Christ, all people, no matter their ethnic background, no matter their family background, no matter their, their history, no matter how ugly your past might be, you are invited to be a part of a single family of God. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Even your weird uncle. He can be a part of it, too. And if you are the weird uncle or aunt, welcome, right? God bless you. Welcome. A single, unified church that is marked by peace, peace with God, peace with one another. And how was this peace created? How was it guaranteed? Through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here today, right? That's why we celebrate Easter. That's why we celebrate Resurrection Sundays, because of this historical fact of the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so going back to Jesus' prayer in John 17, when he mentions those who will come to faith through the disciples' words, well, well, what words? Like, exactly, like, can you tell me, like, what words help us to believe on Jesus? It's really simple. It's the gospel. That's what it comes down to. This is the message that saves. This is the only message that saves. The gospel is the only power of God unto salvation, which is available to everyone who believes. And sometimes within churches, we just take for granted the gospel. But isn't it interesting, as Paul writes his letter to the Corinthians, his first letter, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write to you, and I'm actually reminding you of something that I've told you time and time again. Why do you think that is? It's because we're forgetful. It's because we're sheep. Right? We are not as smart as we like to think we are. And sometimes we will convolute, we'll cloud up the gospel with other things. Again, not with like uh, deceitful motives, not, not with a terrible heart. We just, we're not clear. I mean, I've heard, I've heard pastors speak passionately about like end times matters and say, it's the gospel. I'm sorry. When I, we're about to read 1 Corinthians 15, there is nothing about end times anything in the gospel, right? People say, well, what is the gospel? God loves you. We're about to read 1 Corinthians 15. You tell me where it says the gospel is that God loves you. Certainly God loves you, and it's the foundation of the gospel, right? But just knowing that God loves you does not save you. The gospel 
saves. And that's what we have to understand today. This is the gospel, according to Paul's letter to the Corinthians. He says, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. Isn't that interesting? We're being saved. It's kind of a process. We're saved already, but we're also being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, unless you just kind of believed in emptiness, right? Unless it was empty faith. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. What is the gospel? That's step one. Christ died for us in accordance with the scriptures. Why did he die? He died for our what? Sins. That is crucial. You cannot have the gospel without sin. You have to talk about it. It's an uncomfortable situation. No one likes to face that. No one wants to look into the mirror of sin, and yet we're confronted with it daily. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. What is he talking about? He's basically saying, if you don't believe me, go ask them. There's hundreds of them out there who saw him. Don't take my word for it. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church of God. Have you ever felt that you are unworthy to go to church? Have you ever felt unworthy to pray to God? Have you ever felt so unworthy and just so sick in your own sin that you just... You just turn your back to God because your guilt overwhelms you and shames you. I guarantee you, Paul knows how you feel. I, I would say Paul struggled that with his entire life. I'll bet you to the day he died, that was in the back of his mind. He persecuted the church of God. And I just wonder how the guilt and the shame wore on him. But, <laughs> verse 10. He did not have to dwell on that guilt and on that shame. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Hmm. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Wow. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Look at that. I was as religious and as good of a person as anybody could have ever claimed to be. But it was never me that got me into God's grace. It was God. It was his grace toward me. He says, on the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Finally, verse 11. Whether then it was I or they, talking about, whether, so at the end of the day, whether it's me, the other apostles, so we preach. And what? So you believed. What led to their belief? The preaching of the gospel. We have got to be grounded in that. It's got to be just firm and fixed in our minds, right? If anybody were to come up to us, especially an unbeliever, and say, why do you believe in Jesus Christ? Let me share with you the gospel. What is the gospel? God loves you. No. The gospel is that Christ died for your sins, as the scripture predicted he would. The gospel is that because he died on the cross, he was buried into the grave. And then he rose again on the third day, just as the scriptures talked about. And then he, he was visible. He, he was seen by other people. This is a physical resurrection. That is the gospel. For all who have heard the gospel and responded positively by putting your faith in Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, you are saved. And Jesus was praying for that to happen 2,000 years ago. Isn't that amazing? So think about the day you were saved. I wonder if Jesus had that day in mind. Oh, I know. They're going to respond to the gospel today. Amen. They're going to be welcome into my family. But he didn't just pray for our initial salvation or, or our, our justification that we looked at a couple weeks ago. He also prayed for our ongoing 
salvation, right? This is what he taught. When Paul says you are being saved, this is our ongoing uh, salvation in your outlines. Jesus is praying for our sanctification. So he didn't just pray that you got saved. He's praying that you get sanctified over time. He's praying for you right now. That's absolutely amazing. And specifically in this text, I think our sanctification is pictured most powerfully by our unification. Look at verses 21 through 23. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them as you loved me. We've spent a lot of time over the last few weeks talking about unity, not uniformity, right? We're never called to be uniform. We're never called to look the same and act the same and talk the same and walk the same and do the same. That would be really awkward, right? Because then who are we going to follow? Like, are we going to follow Pammy? Like, I don't look good in that dress. Like, it's just not going to work, right? Some may argue differently. Some, <laughs> Some may argue differently. But no, it's not uniformity. It's unity. One mind. A shared purpose. We're to be united in mutual love for one another. It's both ways. We're really good at accepting love. Oh, I love this church because I get loved on. That's great. Do you love on people too? Oh, yeah, I kind of forgot that. Yeah, it's mutual love, right? It's symbiotic, if you will. We're to be united for the shared mission of fulfilling the Great Commission. And for what purpose? So that the world may know that God sent Jesus. And get this, that God loved people, his people, just as he loved Jesus. Did you get that? Loved them, that you sent me and loved them as you love me. The Father loves you like he loves the Son. Have you? We just need to dwell on that for a second. How does that make you feel? Does the Father ever look at the Son and say, you really, you really let me down today. Does the father ever say to the son, what, what are you doing? Why, why are you? No. The father loves the son eternally and perfectly, and now he loves you that way. Isn't it? Can I get an amen in here? Is this working, Bradley? Like, oh my gosh. The father loves you the way he loves the son. My gosh, the truth of God and his gospel is shown to the world through our unity as one body of Christ. Not just in the local church, but in the global church as well. In fact, this is one of the greatest evangelistic tools, I think, that we have to give to the world, is to show the world we are one, right? Whether it's um, from West Coast to East Coast, whether it's the United States to Haiti, right? We are one body. It's only when we divide, it's only when we treat each other poorly that the world sees us and says, I knew it, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. Why would I want to go, to go, go be a part of you? I got that at home, right? <laughs> like, that's, that's me. But every time someone new comes to faith in Jesus and they get born again, it reveals to the world the authenticity of who Jesus is, right? The validity of what he said and the power of what he's done for you and for me. And the love of God and the glory of God is put on powerful display when unity is the picture that people see when they look at the church. And it pains me to think that, especially in America today, the non-believing world is not seeing unity in the church. It's seeing division. And I think we failed, and I think we can do better. So Jesus prays that we be saved. He prays that we be sanctified. And the last thing in your outlines, he prays that he prays. He prays that we be glorified. He prays for our glorification. That is absolutely amazing. Look at verse 24 and 25. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. 
how comforting it's, it is to know that the King of Heaven is praying for you. He's praying for you right now. And he's praying not just that you get through today, not just that you get through this week, not just that you get through this like this hard obstacle that you might be facing in the coming days if you really don't want to you just don't want to have to fight again. You know what he's praying for? That you get to see him. That you get to be where he is. That is absolutely incredible. It's to be with him. It's to see his glory that the Father gave back to him after the resurrection and ascension. Why? Because he loved him before the foundations of the world. It goes back to the very beginning. This is another reason why we believe in eternal security. The, the, the Lord of salvation, the one who secured your salvation, is praying for your salvation and that you receive the final end of your salvation, the final reward, the final gift, which is your glorification. It's nice to know that your parents are praying for you. That's a very comforting feeling, right? I love to know that my mom and my dad are praying for me. It's really, it's really cool to know that your spouse is praying for you. That is probably next to Jesus. <laughs> the best thing to remind myself is that my wife is praying for me. It's nice to know that your pastor is praying for you or that your friends are praying for you. That, that gives you a sense of community, right? But it's a game changer to know that your Savior is praying for you right now, right? And so despite your current circumstances, again, no matter what you're facing, your Lord is praying for you right now. So be encouraged knowing that Jesus Christ is interceding on your behalf. You're not walking through this life alone. And why? It's because he loves you. That's why. Indeed. He loves you. This was his motivation from the very beginning. That's what we read in John 13. At the beginning of the Passover meal, right, when, uh, when uh, John is painting the scene and Jesus is kind of finishing up a particular portion of the meal, he's in his last moments with his disciples before being arrested, before being hung on the cross. All this impending grief and pain and suffering is on his mind. But what does he continue to do? John says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Why did he do it? It's because he loved them. So this whole portion of scripture that we've covered for the last four months, it began with God's love, and it's ending with God's love. He says in verse 26, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. It's Christ's love in us. It's Christ himself in us so that we can more fully know the character and the nature of God. For what purpose? So that the world will know. So that more people would come to faith in Jesus. And this happens when the church refuses to be so inwardly focused that they're just so focused on what goes on inside the four walls. And we look outward. We look beyond ourselves and we see how can we bless our community? How can we help someone? How can we bless our neighbors? What can we do to get outside of ourselves? Again, unity, commitment to a shared purpose and mission. It's a commitment to the Great Commission. That is our mission. 